task. Very good. It's good to be in an educational environment around people that are learning. And uh, and I hope this is meaningful to you. Uh, my name is Michael Kamarn. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for over 25 years, and uh, primarily in the area of I'd call it uh, social justice or criminal defense. And uh, it's been a pretty uh, interesting endeavor. I've had a fortunate, uh, been fortunate in the last 10 years, 10, 12 years, to uh, at my law firm be really deeply involved with the uh, medical marijuana community, and uh, particularly the Michigan <coughs> Medical Marijuana Act. And I found myself representing um, patients and caregivers and doctors and uh, those that are associated with and were uh, engaged in a behavior under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. And what I learned is that it's a very broken system, and I can, and I, part of my uh, presentation is about that. But um, in, 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 the, that's, in the 10 year, 20 year span, um, we had a number of cases that were ended up being kind of significant. It may not be important now, and that it's uh, marijuana has been legalized in Michigan, but uh, at the time, the uh, cases stood for very significant rulings and um, issues that were do or die for patients and caregivers' protections. And uh, I'm going to talk about those a little bit, but when I talk about criminal defense and my background in practicing law as a lawyer, I uh, I don't want to come off as a conspiracy theorist or somebody who's uh, exaggerating, but the criminal justice system is broken, and people that get tied into it can have a very bad go of it. The statistics about uh, people charged with crimes across the country and in Michigan is that 97% of the people that are brought into courts plead guilty, 97%. When it's well known that across the when it's known uh, by scholars and professors that 97% of people are not in fact guilty. And it's a phenomenon that is hard to uh, really explain, but I, uh, it goes back, it comes down to ultimately that the prosecutors are like the kings of the courtroom. They control essentially everything. They're the ones that are in charge of bringing the cases, bringing the charges, adding charges. And uh, it has become a pattern over the last 100 years or 50 years that they overcharge the individual, not the crimes that they're, that they know they can plead guilty, but all, any and all types of crimes, and then as the defendant gets charged, they'll negotiate those crimes away. And uh, that is why we have 97% conviction rate. Uh, now, my firm, I would say the exact opposite's happened. We do not have a 97% plea rate. We have the opposite, maybe 3%, 5%, and it's substantially different than all the other practicing lawyers. And I take great pride in this, and I have clients' success stories to, to back all this up. And it's a phenomenon that I uh, point out as a core of why this system is broken. The entire process itself has turned into a financial incentive for law enforcement and cities and district courts and the circuit court, this is well known, and the financial incentives associated with forfeiture regarding the uh, Controlled Substances Act is also a motivator for it. But what happened over the last 10, 12 years is that we were in a situation where we were able to utilize the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act as a mechanism to fight back, no matter what the prosecutor charged, no matter how severe they wanted to make the case, my clients always were able to assert and go forth with a medical marijuana defense regarding any charges involving uh, cannabis. And it was quite a phenomenon watching this unfold over the last 10 years because when I see all the other cases that are being uh, litigated in the courtroom, I see that 40% of them are marijuana related, 40%. I see that the Michigan State Crime Lab is using its budget to test, of all of its budget, 40% of it is to test cannabis. That's because of the 40% of the cases 
they're taking place in court. I'm seeing people come in and plead guilty, and literally, it looks like, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the um, like safari videos where you got the wildebeest crossing the Mirror River, and everyone's kind of, they, you know, they jump in, and so one follows the other, and they follow the other, and then the alligators eat them. That's kind of what it looks like. It's a mass herding of going over here, and having your case done within a certain period of time, pleading guilty, doing what that person did, instead of really truly analyzing the individual case and asserting the rights that an individual has, the defendant has, not just that are guaranteed in a criminal case, but within the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. And the, one of the phenomena that took place was that in doing so, you know, we would be having hearings and people would testify, we'd have a chance to cross-examine the officers on all these issues. And time and time again, I would ask the law enforcement officers on the witness stand, "How many have you, have you read the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act? They would say, I get answers like, you mean the whole thing? Or not some, you know, in its entirety, which is just such an absurd answer in, in light of the fact that my client sitting next to me is relying on that law to protect them. So, I mean, Besides the absurdity of it, it gave us a tremendous opportunity to utilize it as it was written and to defend clients. And some of the some of the cases, for example, that we uh, were involved in, and some of you may recall this, maybe not, but uh, there's this Brownie case that has this kind of historic uh, presence in the Michigan Medical Marijuana that the defendant's name, Earl Carruthers, is like a friend of mine now. We, the case was going on like eight, nine years. It was. Uh, Significant at the time because of, you know that there was no existing answer to this. Patients and caregivers were engaging in non-plant material ingestion of cannabis, you know, brownies and cupcakes and oils and other things. And the issue would come up of whether or not non-plant material was within the definition of medical use and whether the plant material, non-plant material cannabis was usable marijuana. And the Court of Appeals and a outrageous opinion found that it was not, and that the possession of non-plant material um, cannabis, that you could not see the green leafy material within it, was not medical marijuana, and therefore you defaulted to the public health code, it was illegal, you couldn't possess it. Now, this was you know, a bizarre, crazy case, and um, really had a huge impact, because there's a huge population of patients who are minors, and you know, people that have lung issues, that is probably the reason why they're a patient. And I would say like the, the satirical caption after the Court of Appeals rule here would have been a bunch of people, you know, three or four people, three people, Court of Appeals, with robes on, you know, taking a brownie out of a little kid's mouth and handing them a bong or something. You know, here, here, little kids, smoke this instead of eating your brownie. So it was really an absurd case and um, set the tone for <clears throat> just a, Blitzkrieg of law enforcement behavior where arresting people, you know, they see anything that even is closely related to non plant material, someone's making oil or wax or any of the other um, concentrates, they were arresting them. And uh, I don't think anyone felt good about it, but it continued to happen. I mean, when I say anyone, I mean like the legislatures, even the judges, you know, um, but they continue to do it and continue to push the issue. And uh, not just, yeah, so that's one of the areas where there was an exploitation in, in a case that uh, was uh, utilized in a, in a negative way. The outcome of Earl Crothers' case was also unique in that he had been, after this ruling, he went to trial. So they said he could not argue medical marijuana at all. He went to trial and um, lost. He had no defense. It was kind of like a slow plea. But he did it, and he preserved his appellate rights. I was not his lawyer at the time. We took over on the appeal at that time, we went to the Court of Appeals, and they wrote this terrible opinion, as I mentioned. Um, we tried to go to the Supreme Court, they didn't want anything to do with it. And I, underst I understood this because one of the main issues was uh, under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, you could possess 2.5 ounces of usable marijuana, and um, how much non-plant material marijuana was an issue really destined for the legislature. They needed to write those numbers down and what the weights and measurements would be. Nevertheless, so we went to the Supreme Court, they were not interested, it got remanded back to the trial court, and we were entitled to, to uh, assert our affirmative defense, that was one of the remedies of the Court of Appeals, which we did, we were successful, and then we were scheduled for trial to uh, uh, proceed and be able to assert a defense, 
and the prosecutor's office appealed that, and they took it all to the Supreme Court and came back and been lingering for a while. And they finally uh, capitulated about a month ago, about a month ago, and uh, Millie pressed the case, and his conviction that was entered in the jury trial was removed. The crazy part about it was that at the time that we got a right to go to trial in a certain defense, he'd already served uh, two months in jail and done probation for five years. They couldn't hurt him anymore. I, I, I've never been in that situation. I would even suggest no lawyer will be in the situation where they were they'd be going to trial. The defendant sitting next to them had already been punished for the crime that they've been that they're being tried for now, and it didn't matter really if they were convicted or not because they already served their punishment. They couldn't hurt him anymore. Just totally uh, oddity, procedural wise, wise and um, I mean, substantively also. What was uh, really important about that case was that um, this issue of usable marijuana and non, you know, non-usable marijuana, plant material, non-plant material. Mm-hmm. And I'm using the word marijuana this entire time. The Michigan State Forensic Science Division, the lab, had uh, begun discussing this case within their uh, lab technicians and brought in a bunch of other people to consult because they wanted to address the issue of how they were going to report these materials that they would be, you know, after they were seized, they'd be sent to the lab and they need to test them to see what they were. And uh, it's not like this is new. I mean, prior to the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, there was non-plant material that people were getting arrested for. Um, but what happened was they used this case, even though it was about marijuana, to change their lab policy reporting procedures. And they came up with a uh, policy that suggest that the policy reported if it was not plant material, it was synthetic THC instead of reporting it as marijuana. And when they, then after that policy had been put into place, they changed it again. And then the policy at that time was we're not sure what the origin of the THC is. Could be from marijuana or it could be synthetic THC. And I had a client out of the west part of the state in uh, Ottawa, Michigan, and uh, his name is Max Lorenz, and he was one of the people that was charged with the possession of synthetic THC. The police had come to his house because his uh, wife at the time had, had a medical issue and they found like, a little container of uh, a little empty container that has a smidge of, they called it a smidge in the police report, of uh, like THC, something or other, you know, some kind of oil or wax or something. But it wasn't even within the container, but they tested it and they reported a lab report as synthetic THC, which is absurd. And um, the circuit court judge understood the significance of this and uh, he was bound over and the court ultimately um, dismissed the case because they couldn't establish and couldn't prove that it was synthetic THC. They then changed their policies. I said that they weren't sure if it was synthetic THC or um, cannabis. But what, what the irony of all this is that we later subpoenaed or FOIA'd the uh, conversation amongst the MSP Forensic Science Division, and it was a cesspool of uh, bad actors. And what I mean by that is Within this series of emails that they had to turn over to us, we learned that the lab was having this discussion based on the coroner's case, and part of the discussion would be involving police officers who were emailing and <coughs> access to the lab. And the decision of how the lab was going to report this was influenced by law enforcement officers. Some of the things that were written in email were, if you report this as synthetic THC, we have prosecutors in our county that will charge synthetic THC and then they can't use their card to protect themselves and we can forfeit their vehicle and take their stuff in emails. One of the directors of an organization that runs the prosecutor's training group was consulted on this issue. And there's an email from him that says, if you're going to ask me, my opinion is all THC is Schedule 1. And that's not true. The way they report is either Schedule 1 THC, which is synthetic, or it's marijuana, one or the other. So when he says it's all THC is Schedule 1, he's saying the default is synthetic, which is not true. In fact, the law is just the opposite, and it's, it's a case from 1973, same situation. Someone's convicted of synthetic THC, and on appeal, the court said he can't prove that it's synthetic THC. The default is 
cannabis or, mar or marijuana. So this was uh, remarkable, and uh, my law firm actually sued the state of Michigan and uh, the crime lab in an injunction in federal court, you know, asking for the relief that the crime lab no longer report non-plant material as synthetic THC or as this bizarre, we're not sure what it is, uh, could be synthetic, could be marijuana. And um, while that case was pending in federal court, I had the opportunity to have what is known as Dauber hearings, which in law is uh, an evidentiary hearing which challenges the admissibility of evidence because it's not scientifically accepted within a community or it shouldn't be admitted because it's not reliable. And it was in two different courts that I had this, and the Michigan State Crime Lab directors and the lab people all came in and defended this policy over and over again, both jurisdictions. And, uh, the, and, and ultimately, we were ruled against in the, one of the jurisdictions. The other jurisdiction, it continued into the year beginning of 2017, and the lab person that was testifying announced that they changed their lab policy back, or they changed it again a third time within a two-year period of time. And they changed it to, a, a, you know, the way it should be that the default is marijuana, and that, uh, and that, certain requirements of the lab people compel them to do certain evaluating in reporting it as as marijuana. And the most interesting part about this experience for me was that there was a there was one or two lab personnel, one of whom is I have to say his name because he's a hero to me, Bradley Choet. And he was a director of uh, the lab in Lansing. And within the emails that we received from the state of Michigan, he was the one email that would uh, stand out, and it was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it'd be ultimately something like, I love science. What are you doing? We are scientists. We read the data, and we report it as we see it. We don't get influenced. Someone could get convicted of synthetic THC. It's a seven-year felony versus a misdemeanor. What are we doing here? I mean, it was literally like the guy who was saying, we, this is totally not right. So he became my witness. So I was calling someone from the lab to testify why, about these emails and why he believed they were wrong. And I asked him one day, I said, why, what do you do? You're the director of the Lancy Lab. What do you do when you get the police department sends you a brownie? He said, we don't test it. Just stay on the shelves. And then uh, I asked him, are you afraid of insubordination or something like that? He said, no, not at all. And he said that with confidence because science is you know, the truth, so to speak, in, in forensic science anyways, and he knew that what he was doing was, was righteous. Anyway, so when they changed the lab policy, they did exactly how he had stated it within the emails and whatnot. The most remarkable thing is that his comments were within the data we have ourselves from our own the GCMS, this fancy machine that they use that's, as a you know, accuracy uh, presumption. Um, Turning the pages, you see that there's all this you know, CBD, CBG, CBA, which are um, unique to the cannabis plants. And the idea that the THC that they were identifying was synthetic was even more absurd because nobody knows how to synthesize these other chemicals and no one would be infusing them into this synthetic THC. It made no sense. And it was right there before them. Anyways, the... Um, so they changed the policy. Ultimately, the federal court dismissed our lawsuit because they changed the policy, and their position was no one had any immediate harm in the future, and any past cases would be dismissed like the Max Lorenz case, so no one has anything to worry about. The problem is that I still have cases that are pending where the lab is still defending this uh, policy. But um, it was, uh, so those are a couple of cases that got a lot of uh, newsworthiness and, and were effectuated and effectuated policy in the long run. I should mention that Max's Lorenz, Max Lorenz's child was uh, taken by CPS and we fought, we ultimately got him back after like uh, almost two years. And um, I know Dan's probably mad at me because I'm going past my, uh, my topics here, but I do want to mention this is this is also an interesting issue that still exists right now, and I don't know if people are aware of it, but uh, 
the CPS issue, Child Protective Services, is a uh, remains a serious issue for social social justice side of, of cannabis um, for these reasons. You know, CPS is the uh, Child Protective Services, and they investigate complaints where there's any allegation, whether it's valid or not. They'll investigate um, and follow through if there's a complaint of some kind. And uh, what happened a few years back is that the um, Organizations around the state that were uh, religious affiliated, that had their own, um, you know, followings, you know, like a religious group that's got members, and they, th these groups came to the state of Michigan and said, we will do your CPS work for you. We will um, find placement for the children when they're temporarily removed, we'll oversee the case, we'll make recommendations to the court, we'll show up and testify, we'll meet with the children and the pe pe our people that we place in the homes, and we'll make a recommendation to the court what should happen. And uh, we can do it much cheaper than you're paying now, and uh, we, you know, so they into a contract. But three years later, they came back and said, we can't do this for the price that we said we could, um, unless you write a law that allows us to discriminate, discriminate on our decision making based upon our fundamentally, deeply held religious beliefs. And the legislature wrote a law saying that that's fine, you can do that. So what was really interesting in the uh, Max Lorenz case was that this agency, Bethany Christian Services, that uh, operates under a you know a religious uh, you know doctrine, um, one of which on that list is that uh, under no circumstances will cannabis ever be acceptable, whether it be legal or medical or any reason, as a matter of religion, and. Um, for that reason, that reason alone, they recommend they took you know Max's kid uh, Dante and they placed him with one of their people and uh, continuously reported to the court that my client had a controlled substance problem, even though it was never articulated what they were talking about. And I had the pleasure of cross-examining the uh, person that was making the decision. She was a 25-year-old woman who had gone to religious college and was working for Bethany Christian Services. And when I asked her about what about the state law that protects people that are medical marijuana patients and you have to come up with a reason other than they're just a patient and have a card? She said, oh, we don't follow that. That's not our, that's not what guides us. And uh, then I asked her, well, what do you know about marijuana? Do you, you know, do you know if he is using CBD or high THC? Have you ever seen him impaired or what appeared to be high? No, 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 no. And uh, there was no reason for any of that, and, and, I mean, it was it was a really interesting uh, turning point for me in, in that you just saw that there was this uh, vapid gap of information that uh, didn't matter, and uh, power of these organizations as they're functioning, relying on their uh, deeply held religious beliefs to remove children permanently is uh, a real problem. It still exists. These agencies are still in, uh, in play. In fact. Uh, you may have heard our Attorney General, one of the first points of order that she uh, dealt with when she became, when she came into office was to settle the lawsuits of LBGTQ community, you know, people that had uh, suffered the same, you know, kind of removals and placements and lack of, a, you know, couldn't adopt for that reason because of the deeply held religious beliefs of the organization. And, before, you know, the previous administration had been sued, right? not the administration, but the Bethany had been sued and the Attorney General's office was defending that. When she came in, she's, uh, she's settled a couple of those cases, but they're still not completed and uh, there's still a lot of fighting about this right now. And, it, and the reason is because our existing law says that it is okay to discriminate based on deeply held uh, religious beliefs. So, that is an issue that still remains uh, <coughs> despite the fact that uh, the next topic we're going to talk about is that Michigan has legalized cannabis. And uh, let me talk about that for a second. That's a much more. Uh, Happier topic, I guess. Happier, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, I can say all the suffering that I, that I went through with my clients, I would say uh, this is, this is uh, fortunately, the result uh, of it. So, as we all know, in uh, 2018, the uh, Michigan voters. I'm asking for you sure. to describe this. Do you know your expectations oh, yeah. from my system? 
Okay. Um, can everybody grab some of these? I know there's a couple of them. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. I think I hit some of the back of my card, but I'm a big fan of that, too. <laughs> Um, so, uh, marijuana is legal for adults over the age of 21 to merge law, to uh, regulate, and tax like alcohol. Uh, marijuana Act is, uh, was enacted in, the, in December of 2018. And there's two ways to really, it, it should be divided into two different areas. One is the behavior of individuals that are uh, possessing, and using, and interacting with the plants or the material. And then there's the business side of it, which is a different uh, animal dealing with licensing and uh, rules and uh, administration for the state. But for adults who are uh, 21 and over, the premise is that uh, they're allowed to possess 2.5 ounces of marijuana. You're allowed to uh, smoke and ingest cannabis. You're allowed to grow 12 plants in your home. You're allowed to drive within your vehicle. Um, and there are some prohibitions that we can talk about as well, things to look out for. And uh, most importantly, I'm going to start this by, you know, what, what, are the, what, what are you not allowed to do? What are the things that are going to uh, find you in uh, police custody or something? Yes, sir. Um, so they said, you said the, uh, you can only have two and a half ounces on you, right? Correct. So, like, is that at home, too? No, at home, you can have 10 ounces. From the plants that you throw, but it's supposed to be locked up. Yeah. And then there's an additional penalty for marijuana that um, it can be a civil infraction as well. That is the marijuana that's from your own plants. <laughs> yeah. It's connected like to that. Twelve plants. It can be way more than ten ounces. Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, that's the point. It was grown from those plants, and it's way more than ten ounces. It's locked up. Your liabilities are either civil infraction or there's a new type of thing that they created. It's called a non jailable misdemeanor, which doesn't didn't exist in the coding and when they enter things for what a conviction is, they had to create a new one. Because generally speaking, if it is non jailable and there's no liability for going to jail, it's really a civil infraction. So it's an odd middle ground that they kind of came up with, but that's the scenario that one would uh, find themselves in. You know, you, you raise an interesting point, and um, there's no question in my mind that this <coughs> law was designed to legalize cannabis for adults over the age of 21. It also goes on to talk about how it's intended to create a regulatory system for the sale and, and business of uh, and commercial business. But there's no question that it legalizes. It doesn't decriminalize, it legalizes it. And, and um, there's various interpretations of how the law is to be uh, interpreted. And, 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 and there's been some prosecutors that have uh, suggested certain interpretations, which I disagree with. And I can tell you about a couple of cases of things that have happened. For example, I didn't mention it, but you're allowed to gift 2.5 ounces to somebody else without remuneration or without the without money uh, being exchanged. And um, so that is something that is proclaimed and said you can gift without remuneration, but it doesn't have a exact penalty for what happens if you do. Another one is if you uh, smoke marijuana in public. You let the you let the smoke marijuana, but not in public is the so without, and there's no specific penalty associated with that. There is penalties, as you're aware of, the uh, 10 ounces and more that it, it refers to in section 15, the punishments of things that are outside of your, your uh, section five in, in, in the uh, recreational statute. But there's an interpretation that's being offered that is if it doesn't have a specific penalty associated with it, you default out of the recreational law back into the public health code meaning it is now a crime again. So the, I've, I've seen a couple statements by uh, some prosecutors <clears throat> that have interpreted such as, well, what if we see someone smoking marijuana um, in public? What is the penalty? And they suggested that it would be a possession of marijuana, which is not a, which is not a 
a legalization penalty. You know, legalization penalty is a civil infraction or this other misdemeanor without, you know, it's not jailable. But the suggestion is that it's possession of marijuana or use of marijuana. That's in the public health code. That's the prohibitions that penalize and, and have licensing sanctions and, you know, other types of consequences that subject you to probation and, you know, jail. So I, uh, I, I find it uh, intellectually dishonest to suggest that that's a proper interpretation, but I can tell you that I know of a couple cases that have uh, occurred already. I think that what you're going to see is a lot of disparity amongst county to county across the state in terms of which prosecutors are going to be doubling down on it being illegal and trying to criminalize it still, and other prosecutors that, that don't care. Um, I could tell you, uh, you know, um, I, I, I know of a case in the west part of the state where you've heard people who maybe, uh, but the, um, they're giving out, oh, they're, they're buy a t-shirt and I'll give you two and a half ounces of marijuana content yeah. or what have you. Mm -hmm. So some law enforcement agency did, a, you know, a couple undercover buys pretending to be, um, adults over 21, and uh, they raided the person and charged them with a continuing criminal enterprise, which is the most severe of a, of a drug crime <coughs> that could be uh, charged. It's a 20-year maximum and all these severe forfeiture uh, penalties associated with it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, premised on it. It's like the state RICO. It's like a you know, racketeering criminal enterprise kind of crimes that they're, you know, that are involved with that. Um, I've had other situations where, um, you know, I heard a child had uh, gotten a couple of gummies that her parents had and went to school with them and got caught or gave them to somebody and they, I mean, you think that would be like, blow the doors off, you know what I mean? They ended up charging the kid with minor possession, which is a civil infraction. Now, you know, he used to not be, he was always criminalized, but, uh, but that's just one particular prosecutor's office. I mean, I can see it being much worse, you know, and Bethany Christian Services get involved in that one for sure in another jurisdiction. But, um, so there's a lot of disparity. The, the, the um, intellectual dishonesty is, is grounded in this. Prosecutors say, well, if there's not a penalty associated with the um, recreational law, then it defaults into the um, public health code. This is a similar argument that was made with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. And I, re I remember this language as being so defeatist, but the idea was and courts would, once, once this became part of the jurisprudence, it would be restated over and over in cases, and it went something like this. The Michigan Medical Marijuana Act didn't legalize marijuana, it merely created a um, protected class of individuals, or protections for a class of individuals who are in strict compliance with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act for behavior that would otherwise be illegal. So, so it didn't legalize it, it just, for, for some people it made it, um, protected behavior, which would otherwise be illegal. But the, but the recreational law says at the very beginning, the premise of it is this law is intended to legalize marijuana for people over the age of 21. The last paragraph is of the statute is this statute is intended to be interpreted broadly to conform with the other paragraph in section one, which is to legalize marijuana for adults over the age of 21. Um, all right. so. Just to go over a couple of the things, so this is meaningful, and you can say that I uh, explained this in some way. We can take some questions afterwards. But uh, do the 2.5 ounces have to be wet or dry? Is there an issue about that? There's no specificity within the language. I think that uh, law enforcement will certainly err on the side of arresting you and letting the court figure out later. Keep it below 2.5. Can you transport plants or clones or tissue cultures in your car? Uh, there's nothing specific within the law that says this. Uh, the fact that it's supposed to be interpreted broadly, I would suggest you'd be able to get away with it. I'd say if you had 12, is that less than 12 plants that you're working with that uh, you're in a better position than if you have more than that? Although there's now many different definitions between the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, the 
you know, the Michigan Medical Marijuana License and Facilities Act as to what marijuana is and defined and what a plant is and how that's defined. But um, I would not go about it in a way that is uh, intending to be transparent. Like if you're going to trans transport marijuana clones or whatever, I would put them in your trunk and try to you know cover whatever smell may be and not expect a lot of work for you, but um, avoid all you know encounters if you can. But I don't think that at the end of the day that's an illegal act. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm a medical marijuana patient. I've heard. Yes and no on my question of whether or not it's okay to have marijuana within reach in your car. I've heard that I could get in trouble for that. I've heard that it has to be in a locked box in your trunk. So I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a good question. And we're talking, okay, so I would say that the, um, the issue you're talking about has been resolved. And I can give you an exact answer. In fact, there's a, you know, like this Carruthers case, the Barney case, 2016, the Michigan legislature created what I would call the Carruthers Amendments, and they rewrote the law. And they said that you're allowed to have a certain amount of solids and liquids and gassy cannabis, and new weights and new measurements. And when they did that, they spoke specifically to the transportation of certain types of marijuana. And what they said was that if you're going to transport concentrates or uh, marijuana infused products, they have to be in an enclosed container outside of a reach if you don't have a trunk, and um, you have to have a uh, log of where you got it from from your carrier. Now, my advice on that is, this is, you know, this is absurd. I don't have a carrier on my card. Well, you'd have to explain how where it was made and where you made it and, and things like that in, in a log, like a, like your uh, trans, you know, like a trucker carrying their, their load where it came from, the uh, manifest is what they would call it. Um, I'd suggest you don't do that, you keep it out of reach, but it's the concentrates that are issued. If if, if the, the penalty is a civil infraction, two hundred fifty dollar fine, written within the statute, so it's not arrestable. Maybe they could take it, probably would, and they would give you a ticket. It should not be arrestable. Now, for for many years, uh, there was an issue that they were arresting people if any marijuana was within reach because a law had been enacted, not in the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. It was an amended, in a different statute. They came up with this transport law, which said you can't transport usable marijuana within, you know, within reach. It's got to be in an enclosed container or if you don't have a, you know, in a trunk. And uh, that was later ruled to be in conflict with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Now, they still are probably pulling people over for that, you know. But um, this is resolved with the distinction of plant material and concentrates. Now, you know, if the police pull you over and they see marijuana laying around, it's not the ideal situation because they're going to be suspicious. They may pull you out of the car and, you know, trying to investigate to see if you're quote unquote impaired. Um, so practicality is always the uh, best way to go about behaving with cannabis. You know, you want to avoid any questions about it, pretend like it's not there. Because even though the advancement of thought and understanding of cannabis, you know, by the voters and certainly with medical marijuana, its approval across we still are we still got a lag of the law enforcement community's uh, full-on acceptance of it um, and, and seeing it in a different light. And um, I think they're having a tough time with it right now. And and certainly there's been a lack of uh, additional training and you know going out of their way to make sure that these things are made clear so that interactions with citizens are you know are uh, specific and consistent. We, there's been a lack of that with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, and there's a, anticipated there's going to be a lack of it with the uh, recreational laws. I will say this, though, even though it's not official, an important point on this, and it's certainly an uh, issue that we deal with all the time, is the issue of smell. The smell of marijuana. This is a uh, thorn in the side of any, uh, you know, in most marijuana cases, usually smell that brings the law enforcement uh, people your way or a complaint about smell on a vehicle, and uh, I was uh, involved with the case, a couple a couple of cases that went to the Court of Appeals, and I'm involved with one now, that addressed this issue specifically. There was a case in Ross Common that uh, addressed the issue of whether or not smell alone with no other activity at a traffic stop and someone has a medical marijuana card, is that probable cause, right? Because the issue of whether a police officer can search a vehicle is whether or not they
probable cause to believe a, you know, there's um, something illegal within the vehicle. They don't have to know it, they just have to believe it. The smell of marijuana is a Schedule 1, has been a Schedule 1, it still is a Schedule 1, and it is uh, contraband per se, and the presence of it would be illegal in any way, so I'm involved with it. The smell of it within the vehicle would justify someone, uh, officer, anticipating that there's some crime afoot within the vehicle. And this has always been the jurisprudence. There's one case that any time this is challenged, judges rely on this case called uh, Kaczmarek. And um, so now, a couple of judges made some rulings that uh, recognize that, well, if a person has a medical marijuana card, then they're tell to engage in the medical use of marijuana, which wouldn't involve smelling like marijuana. And that's any other visual or in indicia of, of some kind of activity that was uh, would contribute to the finding of probable cause, there would be no reason to uh, search uh, a vehicle. And um, I have heard of different officers, you know, that have been asked questions and spoken on the recreational laws that uh, smell is no longer a uh, reason to search a vehicle, but I don't know that that has been fully accepted across the board and until there's some case law that has uh, said this and they put out a bulletin as they sometimes do to the, you know, law enforcement community, the Michigan, Michigan State Police will publish uh, you know, legal updates or whatnot, they're going to uh, use their discretion, I think, at this stage. So, the, you know, the situation, going back to your question, is to avoid the smell, obviously, and try not to have any visual in the way that would give the officers any reason at all to want to search your vehicle. Usually best practices for that kind of um, situation. Um, you may want to know, if I'm a patient, I'm growing my own 12 plants, what impact does it have with my recreational plants? Can I do all of those at the same time? Because adults are allowed to grow 12 plants in your house, and question is, well, how does that impact my volume limitation as a medical marijuana patient? And the law doesn't speak one way or the other to it. I would suggest that if you are caregiving or growing your own plants as a medical marijuana patient, you know, there's not more than 12 plants per patient. That's been a closed lock facility. Not, not, I wouldn't say 12 plants, 12 plants, 12 plants, but the plants that are growing should be in a closed lock facility. And even though I don't think the law says this, I would advise people to and this would go for the medical and for the recreational growing of plants, that the plants be in a closed lock facility that is not accessible by anyone other than the person who is growing or harvesting those plants. After they're harvested, it's a different story. It's no longer plants. But I will tell you that one of the gotchas over the years has always been that if the police find themselves in a house and they're examining the caregiver situation, determine if they're in compliance, they believe or there's some suspicion that someone else has access. Things as silly as just having a computer on a counter somewhere that would lead to the grow. Um, literally things that absurd, that would be a basis for them to uh, say it's not in closed like the facility because someone else has access to it. And that's not the law, that's not the case law, but that's one of the things they would utilize to pull you out of the immunity. So I would suggest that uh, no matter what, you keep the plants separate and certainly keep your recreational plants separate and distinct from any of the other plants that are growing. In other words, you don't want to be in a situation where you say, well, I'm a caregiver for two people, I have 24 plants, and I just put my recreational plants in there. That would be seemingly a double violation and problematic. And I don't know that, uh, again, if it's too many plants, what's the penalty? It should be a civil infraction. I'm not encouraging this, but you know, to stay within the law, you want to have not more than the 12 plants as an adult you're going for recreational purposes. Yes, sir. Um, between uh, the officers that have the drug recognition expert or the roadside testing that they have now for marijuana, my question is, is there, I mean, about that in general, but uh, is there a defined limit to what's in your body when you last engage with it or what tests do they have to discern what, what limits are where and how those affect certain people and what you're okay to do? It's a great question. I have a whole another section on that. I so assume you put a bunch of time on it. Um, and I don't know how much time we have, let me just check it. We got, how much time we got left? Yeah. 10 minutes. All right. 
I, uh, you know, let, let me do that. Let me talk directly about that, and then we, I can take questions on the Burma. But because I think the driving is, is a really important issue. So let's talk about the uh, recreational law and how it applies to um, the driving issue. Okay. So the law is very clear that you cannot be impaired, okay, uh, or under the influence of cannabis. And um, this is important because it's a proclamation of what the law prohibits now as opposed to what the prior existing laws were. And it's important to understand the distinction. The uh, three different scenarios are adults prior to recreational marijuana who are not patients were subject to what you call the zero tolerance. So if you have one nanogram of THC, active THC, in your bloodstream, and uh, you were driving or operating an automobile, you were subject to the equivalent of a drunk driving charge. You know, um, loss of license, you know, uh, up to 93 days in jail. And um, certainly if you were convicted or pled guilty, you're gonna be subject to all kinds of drug testing and et cetera. And this is big business for the courts. Trust me, it's not something anyone wants to deal with. So it's a terrible, brutal law. And then in, the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act uh, contradicted that and it is a section that says you're not allowed to operate a vehicle if you're a patient, not a caregiver, if you're a patient, while in, you know, impaired. So this law clearly conflicted with the existing zero tolerance and it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Michigan in a case called People versus Kuhn. and they reaffirmed this idea that patients who have cards are not subject to the zero tolerance while they in fact are um, subject only to if there's evidence, and you know, it can be established that they were affected by the cannabis as they were operating the, the motor vehicle. And um, so that's how things were up until the recreational. And now, for adults over the age of 21, like the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, the standard is now are you impaired? Are they driving the vehicle in a way that's not consistent with a normal, ordinary, prudent driver? It's really the impaired standard. And there is no per se number, was, is the answer to that question. And uh, we know this now because the Michigan State Police um, did a report, which is quite interesting and kind of gives us some insight to how crazy things are. The, uh, March of 2019, it's the, uh, the whole Impaired Driving Safety Commission, March 2019. There was a similar one done by, it, it submitted to the Federal Congress, and this really pretty much mirrors it. <coughs> and uh, after much <coughs> debate and, and discussion, the uh, report states that there's, it's, it's not, the right thing to do is to not come up with a per se number, that there's no correlation between the number or the amount of active THC in your bloodstream and impairment. Someone could have one nanogram and be impaired, someone could have about 50 nanograms and not be impaired. That's what this report says. So this, the, the law didn't change. The legislature didn't go forward and after the recreational law had passed, which says you have to prove impairment, was a law enacted that says you, you know, if you're over a certain number of nanograms, um, you are then, you know, per se, you know, uh, impaired. So that's, a, that's good because there's no, unlike alcohol, for example, you know, if we have a per se number of 0.08, and if you're on it, there is a presumption that you are breaking the law. And uh, then, in, from a lawyer's perspective, you're fighting about the accuracy of the machine. That's the battle there. What, whether you were driving fine or not is of no consequence. It's whether or not you were operating the vehicle and you had a breath alcohol level greater than 0.08. That's literally the issue that is always challenging in a uh, alcohol-related driving offense. For cannabis now, the issue is the proof of being impaired while they're driving. And there are a number of different factors that go into this analysis for trial and for even the arrest that leads, you know, that leads to the taking of the person to, to get their blood. But I should mention that I recently got certified as a field sobriety I'm in field sobriety training, got certified as a tester, so I can do your horizontal gaze of staticness and have you walk nine paces if you want later on. But, um, <laughs> what is that called again? Certified. Field sobriety testing. Okay. But the, um, 
and it was a fascinating experience. It kind of reconfirmed all the suspicions that I've always had and cross-examined about, but it put it into an interesting uh, circumstance. And really gave, gave an explanation for why these circumstances, uh, from a driver's perspective, it's important for you to really understand what's going on and why you're going to encounter a lot of times aggressive police officers in this area. And it is primarily based on the idea that they are I'll say brainwashed into believing that there's all this death and destruction, despair on the roads, and if they don't do something about it, it's going to continue. So that's kind of the premise of why they are. Uh, and this is an explanation given to me by the police officer that was doing the training at the uh, certification um, school or what have you. The, um, but at the end of the day, these are important things for people that are driving to understand. There is no uh, per se number, and um, the way that you will get engaged in some into a negative police encounter is if they get you out of the car and they ask you to submit to their field sobriety testing or to drug recognition evaluations. Now, before I talk about those, there's another issue in Michigan which is kind of interesting I want to make a point about. There's this swab testing that has been going on. There was a uh, pilot project about a year ago, and uh, after the pilot project, they reported to the legislature that the conclusions of the report were inconclusive. They needed more money to try to get it, and they expanded now from the limited five counties to pretty much statewide. If anyone is uh, offered to take a swab test, I would suggest you deny it. You, you, it is not a crime to uh, not take it. It is not uh, illegal. Um, I can tell you the reasons why, which are that it's unreliable. There are other preliminary tests that a person can be offered at the side of a road. I'm going to suggest to you that you not take those either, including the portable breath test, the preliminary breath test, and the field sobriety test. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about the data master, but it's also known as the breathalyzer machine. It's called the data master. This is the machine at the station. Okay, if you get arrested and they take you back there, they should read you your chemical test rights which say you've been arrested. I'm going to ask you to take a breath test or a urine test or I'm going to ask to draw blood. If you refuse, you're subject to the implied consent law, which is you lose your license for a year. You're entitled to a hearing, but it's you know, an uh, administrative judge. It's not really a real hearing. I mean, really. But nevertheless, um, and I would, and it's on a case-by-case -case basis that a person would make that decision of whether they want to refuse that or not. If we're talking about blood or breath, most of the time if you refuse, they will get a search warrant and they'll get it anyways, okay? So think about that as well, because if you're going to hold out for that, the best you're going to get is some time, but they're so equipped now with getting search warrants via phone and whatnot that it's not even that uh, much of an advantage. But. Um, so that is some give me the thing, but and I want to be specific. The field tests out in the field are all things that you can refuse. It may result in your arrest, but they don't have the results of those field tests. But if they do arrest, you get back to the station, the data master, or if they ask after being in custody and they've read you your rights, they will tell you that uh, if you don't consent after a lawful arrest, you will finally lose your you lose your license. Now the other side of it is if you do consent, if you do give a, a sample for a breath test, you can get an independent test done at your expense. Um, all right, so let me explain why I am opposed to, and it's my position that you should not take the uh, field sobriety test. The this interaction at the roadside is a uh, you know it's the entire case of a, of a drunk driving it involves multiple factors, and it's not just the field sobriety test, and this is the, the significance of it. There's three factors. There's the fact of how the driving was before you get pulled over. There's the officer's interaction with the driver when they come upon the vehicle. And then there's the third factor, which is when they get you out of the car and have you do the field sobriety test. Now, usually, when they flip on their uh, lights and they follow you, there's a video of the vehicle. So you have this evidence that's clear as day, no one has to talk about it, no interpretation by a non-human, it's video, and assuming that the vehicle is not swerving all over the roads and able to negotiate and get off and bring the car to a halt with, that's not in some kind of 
you know, out of the norm, that is a piece of evidence that goes in your favor in the category in the first first frame of this analysis. The second of the officer coming up onto the uh, driver's side is the test of whether the person is able to get together their documents that they have in the car and have to have in order to be driving, such as a driver's license, proof of insurance, and registration. And then are, those are the only things that are required of you to do when you're interacting with a police officer. So make sure you have those and are able to reach those with ease because that ability to do so, and if you can do it, is another favorable to any traffic stop uh, analysis of whether you are impaired or intoxicated. Now, practicality is the key here, and each case is different. So you don't want to start up with, uh, you know, immediately confrontational with the officer. Maybe you do, but it calls for a uh, <laughs> case by case basis. You certainly want to know that you don't have to give any answers. All you have to do is give them those documents. That's it. They usually would like to ask you a question, like, you know why I pulled you over? And they want you to make an admission because then it's over. They can do that. They got you there. They're going to write you a ticket. And while they're there, they're going to try to make something out of the traffic stop. That's a mantra that police officers live by. Make something out of that traffic stop. Um, so you don't want to contribute to it. And, and the fact is that if they pull you over, it's a lawful stop. You did some kind of traffic stop, or even if they're, they pulled you over illegally, they're going to stand there, and they're going to want to, they have to get to it. They have to either write you the ticket, move on. They certainly aren't there and allowed to continue to investigate and look for crimes. The only reason why they would do it is if you engage them in chatter, and, you know, start discussing things with them. And I would suggest that you have some kind of um, response ready, such as, uh, you know, I don't know, officer. I figured you were going to tell me that. Why you pulled me over? Or here are my documents. You know, my lawyers told me not to answer any questions. At, you know, they're asking me, am I free to leave? These are the buzzwords, OK? I don't, yeah, they start asking me questions that sound investigatory. My lawyers told me not to answer any questions. Am I free to leave? Are you going to write me a ticket? But, you know, politely. With, there are some uh, answers given on these cards. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, everyone's got you know, these are you know sometimes these don't sound good coming out of a certain type of person's mouth. Others, you know, I'm saying it's, it's all. I'm saying that you got to frame it into your own. You got to be able to say it and believe it and you know and stand by it. Yes, sir. Oh, you wanted to mention this earlier, but I just want to make sure I hear it. What is the punishment? Like, I'm under 21. If I possess marijuana out in public and got like stopped by a police officer or something, I possessed marijuana or was high and didn't possess marijuana. Like, oh, you're driving or? No, just like out and about. Well, <laughs> that is a good question. I think that some prosecutors would say that you're subject to possession of marijuana because you're not protected under it. I think others, as I said, may think of it as a minor in possession and treat it as a civil infraction. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get to the idea of how you would be deemed to be like high. If I if just what like smelled had, like a okay. or something. Well, here's the thing. If, uh, I understand, okay, so if you're encountering a police officer, I would suggest you're not going to answer any questions. You're not going to get anything. And, 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 you know, unless you're, I mean, allowed to walk on the street, you're not behind the vehicle, they can't, they don't have the authority to um, arrest you or detain you. They may ask you for your driver's license, you don't have to give it to them, but if they, but if you try to leave, you know, you, you know versus giving it to them, you don't have to give them the drug list. Oh. But, uh, you know, that's one of those calls you have to make, you know. I mean, I would think if the police are coming up to you out of nowhere, you know, usually, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why they would do it. Not always, not always good reasons, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, the encounter at the, road, at the window is important in terms of being able to uh, be clear that you do not have to give any information to any of the uh, any officer that's asking questions, just the documents that I'm talking about. Now, you have these two pieces of the puzzle as to whether or not there's impaired driving, intoxicated driving, that they are evaluating, those being the driving part of the pullover and the interaction of the window. And if they ask you to get out of the car to perform some tests, I'm suggesting that at that point, they've already made their decision that they're going to arrest you. And if that's true, then the question becomes, is there, what is the likelihood that you're going to pass whatever test they're going to give you? And um, I say this with the following in mind. Number one is there's nothing normal about a traffic stop. Usually people are not, you know, 
practiced in this area. It's not something you encounter every day. Maybe some people more than others, but it's not something that's ever the same. You know, it's always weird. You know, you get some random, random acts of kindness and some really terrible events that people get hurt. So there's there's nothing normal about it from the driver's side. They're not accustomed to it. You know, who knows what was going on inside their mind before that happened? Usually, it's because they're distracted or something like that that they would do a traffic offense that would draw attention to themselves. Um, and certainly the same is for the police officer. They don't know what they're getting themselves into. You know, their whole thing is officer safety, officer safety. They'll shoot you if they think you know things aren't safe for them, and, and not bad an eyelash about it. So they're they're already predisposed to be, even though trained, there's nothing normal about that traffic stuff. And with all that in mind, you're going to have someone step out of a vehicle, and they're going to be asked to pass these three tests that no one believed or knows whether you're going to pass them before, right? But at the end of the day, they don't make you, the tests are absurd, okay? The tests are designed to fail, and further, the tests do not in any way, shape, or form give any evidence or indicia of cannabis impairment. The literature is overwhelming in this area. The field sobriety tests are three that have been approved for standardized field sobriety testing by NHTSA, the National Highway Safety Traffic Association, which makes all the rules and came up with the .08. It used to be .10, and at one point, Michigan was point, well, 1 1.5. You know, that was the legal limit at one point. So, <laughs> so it's this organization that promulgates these rules and suggests that they are, if done properly, can provide information on whether a person is intoxicated by liquor. That's it, nothing else. There's no direct correlation of any of these three tests having an indication in terms of someone uh, with cannabis in their system. The three tests are the eye test, the stand on one leg test, and the walk nine paces on the invisible line, turn around and come back on it as well. And as I said, I, you know, the, the, there's, you know, who, how many people did they test to, you know, that were, that were not intoxicated or impaired by anything beforehand? That's not, a, that's not, a, that's not a statistic that they rely upon. And there's no source by which the proclamations of why the evaluation of these tests are indicative of in impairment. Um, and they are trained to look for clues of the three different tests. And there's 10 clues for each of the tests. They look for two. Sometimes they're around thinking two, three, two. That's enough for an arrest. You may have done eight, you know, Two, three, two, seven, eight, eight. Pass of the ten on each of them, and they're calling it three, two, two, and they're arresting you. So, it's an impossible test to pass. And I don't know that anyone can pass. We ran you through them right now. In terms of balancing, you don't get two tries at it. They don't make you pass these tests to get your driver's license. If a police officer saw someone standing on one leg at, at eleven o'clock at night on the side of the road, they go over and try to help them. But if you're pulled over at 11 o'clock at night, you're gonna have to do that to, to prove the officer that you, can, you should be allowed to go home. It's really an absurd situation. And when you hear about the way that it is trained and the expectations um, of, and the, the aggressiveness by which they are looking for outcomes before, without ever really looking for evidence, you understand why there's such a, such a high rate of uh, these kind of actions. Now, I'm not advocating for drunk driving. I'm not advocating for anyone. Being impaired driving, you're not allowed to be impaired while you're driving. But I do see over and over people getting grabbed up into the system because of these nuances and and um, the you know automatic failure of the test. So in the grand scheme of things, from a lawyer's perspective, I talked about the three different areas of where evidence is gleaned and for the issue of whether it was justified in the arrest and the evidence that a jury would hear. If you have one and two, and there's no three. The case is a ton, ton, ten times better. If you have one and two and they're modest, and then you get out of the car and you start falling all over yourself, and the cops say your eyes are, you know, not smooth pursuit, just making, you know, subjective answers, and they get them stand with their badge and their boots and stuff, and, you know, that's, that's what you're up against. So instead of, you know, me needing to cross-examine them on this stuff and try to shred them in front of the jury if they're paying attention, don't don't even have them in play for your case. 
You know what I mean? And uh, if we're just fighting about the driving and it's reasonable, you stop and give the information, you know, and you refuse the test, they say you refuse the test, okay. Versus the silliness that takes place. I mean, this one case I had, I was up at Ross Commons uh, yesterday or Monday, and uh, I mean, the, you know, it's a, the officer has the person looking in the direction of where you, you know, you see from the police car behind them, and all the lights flashing, you know, as he's doing the eye, I have words on a case that the training says don't do it when there's lights flashing. You know, it's, it's, it's absurd. And he's making all these proclamations. First of all, there's, you know, the eye thing is a joke, because I mean, would you have a doctor examine your eyes and try to make a diagnosis of me under those circumstances? You know, it's, um, <laughs> it's, 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 it is, it's an absurd uh, a premise of, uh, but there's big business here, and off, you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, you know, it's the hoopla that goes along with the concerns. The worst part about it is this, and, and it's interesting because the uh, issue of uh, THC in the blood also has a, I guess, crime lab uh, scandal associated with that. I like to call it hashtag crime factory. You know, they like to create crimes. But the um, reporting of the amount of THC in the blood is. Um, Reported as one number, at, you know, in this particular case, it's 17. This is one case that I have 17 nanograms of THC. And uh, in science, this is not a number. You know, it's, it would be 17.00 or 04, 02, something like that. So it's just a strange and odd, and it's one number, not two. Not they did it again, and it's the same. And one of the key components of science in this capacity is that, you know, you, there's uh, accuracy and precision of the reporting that they can reproduce the same results over and over again, and uh, the machines are accurately calibrated. So um, I, I challenge the uh, fact that the reporting of the blood doesn't state in the lab reports an error rate. They can't say that if we did the test again, it, it would be the same number or another number you know, if we continue to repeat it, which is the core fundamental of any scientific, and it's, it's a requirement in order to to be considered science. You know, that's that's what scientists uh, expect. And the alcohol, for example, has a error rate of 0.04. So point, you know, point, uh, 0.8 is the legal limit. That means that the um, testing of the machine, calibrating the machine, would have to be within an error rate of 0.04 in either direction. So they took it as 0.8% of alcohol, put it to the machine, it should print out a ticket of 0.8. What instead, or it would allow 0.84 or 0.76. That's the variable. And that is acceptable within uh, <coughs> error rate or uncertainty. I'm not sure to make this complicated, but um, the there's none associated with the THC. So we uh, challenged this in court. And the um, and then I subpoenaed the information from the lab, and they came back with that the error rate or the uncertainty rate for THC in the blood is 29 percent. 29 percent. That means the 17, one number, if tested again, could be I think it was 4.523 or something like that difference the first time. And if we did it again, it could be you know be down to 17 to you know like 12 or 11. The next time it could be down to 79. You know what I mean? Just not scientific, just variables that don't that don't matter. Not scientific at all. So what was really interesting is that the prosecutor argues it doesn't matter if it's accurate. It doesn't matter if it's accurate because there's no per se number in Michigan. But here's the best part. When I was asking about this and I filed this motion, she called the lab tech who did the testing. And the lab tech wrote a letter saying, you know, we had this conversation, I want to document writing, I want to give you an explanation why we do not report an error rate. We have one. We just told the defense counsel on this, but let me tell you why, prosecutor. The question that he's asking me is that our accreditations require us to have error rates because we're scientists. And we don't include it within the report because our clients don't ask us to. And our clients are you, prosecutor, and the police. Okay? So when you think about how many lab reports are produced that people have pled guilty to having whatever the number of uh, nanograms are in your system, and all along we've known that it's not an accurate number. Think about someone that's got the gun. 
one or two nanograms. Think about the time not too long ago when zero tolerance, zero tolerance was the was the law. You know, I mean, forget that the state police have now said that that doesn't matter if you want to, you know, the, the, the number doesn't matter. But now we know that the lab has been uh, inaccurate all these years to be able to state the number with any specificity um, or be certain or precise about it. And, uh, and they admitted that they're being paid to do so by the, by the state. So it's uh, kind of uh, not a great state of affairs. And I do think, unfortunately, this is gonna be a big area that law enforcement is gonna be focused on. And uh, I just, you know, if people are empowered with this information, sometimes you can make a good decision at the time instead of not knowing and not, you know, realizing what's going to happen uh, if you just play along, you know. So, and I would say this also, you know, if for the, uh, you know, for anyone that's going out there, I know you're all here part of this, story, <coughs> sense, because the uh, sensible drug policy is, you know, what's, uh, the desire, I'm, I'm assuming, in terms, in terms of the themes here. Um, you know, no one's advocating here for people to drive impaired, but there's a certain amount of uh, statistical information that we know supports the idea that this shouldn't be a concern for our uh, community. As I said before, when the Michigan Medical Marijuana had the issue of um, whether zero tolerance was going to be law for patients or patients would not be subject to that, and would be allowed to drive with cannabis in their system so long as they weren't impaired. If any of the concerns were legitimate, we would have heard about it, right? There's 300,000 patients in the state of Michigan. Clearly, if they're driving with cannabis in their system but not impaired was a concern, there would have been accidents all over the country, all over the state, and certainly the opponents of uh, cannabis would have, would have made certain to report that, but there wasn't, there hasn't. And um, I don't even know that there's a correlation, particularly with cannabis accident, if there's an accident associated with, that's usually attributable to the, the cannabis, it's associated with another substance in the body. It's very rarely uh, cannabis is that. And, um, and in terms of uh, the recreational use for adults, you know, every single state that's gone through this has reported you know, reduction in alcohol use, reduction in alcohol fatalities, reduction in overdose, from uh, other drugs. In other words, when cannabis is a choice, even in the party phases, there's fewer deaths and uh, less damage. <coughs> and I always like to, uh, you know, when you're out there arguing as, you know, as an advocate, you know, the argument that you know, either we go back to making alcohol illegal or, you know, you give a group of guys a case of beer, they'll start a fight. You give them a bag of marijuana, they'll start a dance. <laughs> 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 All right, so that's it. That's it. That's, that's, that's the problem. I feel like we're at the end of the uh, time here. person does not have uh, a lawyer working with them. What they have is an, um, a disability advocate through the insurance company, the health insurance company. Anyways, so with this case, they're calling for medical records from all the practitioners, and it's documented that they use medically. But on a federal level, which Social Security is, um, it's still illegal. Now, can that be adversely used on this person to be authorized for disability? It's a good question. You know, there's been some interactions between state and federal laws regarding medical marijuana in the past. I actually got a federal judge in uh, Bay County, the event district of the federal jurisdiction, to dismiss a case of, for something that was in like a federal park. There is some law that says that really what it is, it's legislation that precludes the prosecution of medical marijuana patients assuming that they're in state law compliance, okay? 
that's always the main issue. So, uh, and even there's some other, you know, more significant cases of dispensaries that were charged federally that in other states that they sent back to the state to see if they complied with state law rules before. And if they did, then the feds were precluded under this budget. Like the DEA is not allowed to go after patients or caregivers if they're in compliance with state law. That's the general rule, okay? Now, I would say that has been applied across the board pretty much. If someone is in complete violation, you know, the feds are not going to care. You know what I mean? Um, this is not DEA. This is a different administrative agency. I would say that the Workman's Cop, which is also, you know, which is another government agency that deals with um, payments in, in a capacity, this issue has come up, and every time, every time in any of the agencies that has come up, it is voted in favor of the compliant patient as a matter of law. Okay. In other words, if someone is, you know, the medical use by their doctor is um, recommended by a physician who's licensed in the state of Michigan, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I really don't. And I have not heard of one that has been a preclusion for someone's finding of. I mean, most of the first cases all the way through usually get denied. You got appeal. You know, it's not, that's more of the problem. It may not be based on that. It's that they usually will. Well, it was rejected the first time. Okay. So now they're in that sure. phase where they're going to get it's current common. It's common. They, so but they didn't say it was because of marijuana the first time through. No. Again, they just said she was, that. he or she was injured enough and didn't deserve it. Well, they, yeah, they want to look at medical documentation to see if, you know, from because they don't, they don't want to pay you. I mean, right, they, no, I know. they don't care whether you, uh, I don't want to insult anybody, even if they have a job that might be entail this, but jobs that require sitting for a duration, um, and you can only sit 10 minutes, or you can't walk on hard tile because it hurts your back that kind of a thing. Sure. But the thing of it is, is this relative did not get their license through their primary <coughs> care doctor. They went to a provider that writes this kind of script for chronic pain. And they did not give that provider's information to the advocate. Now, should they be giving that information to the ad, uh, to the, uh, the medical marijuana the, does doctor? It, does it treat does the treating physician know? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, yes, the pain management specialist knows, the physiatrist knows, um, the primary care doctor knows. It's, it's well documented, so that's why I'm saying all those other people's records are being called for. So they're going to be seeing that documentation as they're doing their review before the I don't think it, I don't think it hurts. You know what I mean? It doesn't hurt at that point. It's, it's a missing link in putting it all together. If they, it's even better, though, because it means that the treating physicians may not be comfortable writing the recommendation. They're not disowning the patient, and they're not telling them to go get treatment elsewhere. Right, no. And there may even be, you know, it, it, there's probably a reduction in medications, right? Right. And pain medications. Yeah, and, and, and muscle spasm medicines and stuff. And that's... So should they be providing that doctor that spe specifically prescribes <coughs> marijuana licenses? Or is that really because you you don't see them like you do your No, I know that. And the re because you don't get your ma marijuana from your marijuana doctor, that's why. You get your other medications, you have to go back right. to your script read. I understand, because you're talking about the bona fide doctor patient relationship and whether or not they see them and follow it up. That, that, that's what you're asking. I mean, listen, the uh, if it's documented elsewhere and the other doctors do it in a way that is not negative or you know disparaging to the use you know i don't know that it's going to make a difference they may ask for it later on that's why i'm thinking like i said well where'd you get you know they said well, who got, got your card where's the certification form where's the recommendation that's made i don't see it with your other mm -hmm. doctors or whatnot you know i mean you know that that document they get from them well let me say this did, did they send because one of the choices for the for the uh, patient is for the physician on the form as to whether they want them to share the information with the treating physician. Do you know what I'm yeah. talking about? Yeah. There, there's no, uh, all the providers are um, linked, I guess you could say. Sure. You know, anybody, you know, any one of these providers can share information with the other one. Including the? Medical marijuana. Okay. Well, then they probably have the, they probably already have it because it's, uh, you know what I mean? They would forward that information along to the 
treating physician if they, if they ask for it. Well, the patient can decide. That's a question for the patient. So that, that information may be you know, within the files of the treating physician already. Find that out first, because then it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? And I would say that so long as they have a bona fide relationship, they're looking more for someone that goes to see the cert, you know, certified doctor and doesn't have any other doctors mm -hmm. and never sees that doctor. And that's mm -hmm. would be more gotcha. you know, suspicious mm -hmm. if I was going to be hypercritical. You know what I mean? But you know. So they can't legally hold that against you and deny you based on that fact? Not under state law. I mean, I understand it's federal principles, but they're not they're not using that as a basis, assuming that they're in state law compliance. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've gone uh, a little bit over time, so I'm hoping they can take a picture. And sure, if anybody wants to stick around and ask questions, I'm sorry. I don't know how to do it. This is awesome. No, it was amazing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, everyone thank who's you. willing to take a picture of this stuff, come